So hi, welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I am Kelly Atkinson, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees, and I'm also Barnes & Thornburg's Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator, as well as the Columbus Office Administrator. It's great to see you today. Today's forum marks CMC's annual Harrison Bill Smith Legacy and Civic Engagement Forum, also sponsored by Smith & Hale, Dispatch Media Group, Taft, and the Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing. All are represented here by many friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them? And I'd like you to welcome Tony Kington from Taft to introduce our program. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon. The uh, history of Columbus and the projections indicate that more and more people, up to a million or more, are going to move to Central Ohio over the next 20 years. That and this distinguished group of panelists is one of the reasons the Taft Law Firm was drawn to sponsorship of this particular event because we're experiencing some effects of that. While growth is healthy, these numbers are kind of astounding and we can begin to predict that this kind of population growth will affect every aspect of life from transportation to food, housing in particular, presents both challenges and opportunities. As land use, construction cost, design, zoning, and affordability offer a wide range of options for both of our planners and our residents. So I'd like to introduce our experts on these topics and ask you to welcome, first, the Executive Director of the Building Industry Association, or BIA, of Central Ohio, John Melkai. Chairman and CEO of MI Homes, Bob Schottenstein, President of emh and Sandy Doyle Ahern, Business Editor of the Columbus Dispatch, Jim Weicker, and Principal at VSI, Rob Vogt. Rob is going to lead us through an overview of the BIA study, and then Jim Weicker will lead the panel in conversation. So Rob, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to be at a meeting that I don't have uh, somebody asking me when the rental market is going to soften up, so I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we were uh, contracted by the BIA to study the uh, projected housing need in Central Ohio over the next 30 years. Um, and it's an important issue, obviously, because of, of uh, some of the recent things that have occurred. And one of those things If I can get to the next slide, is, is sort of the dramatic change um, in household income over the past 17 years. We have seen only an increase of 1.1 percent on an annual basis, whereas new homes have gone up an average of 5.6 percent, and uh, the monthly uh, or the annual growth rate in, in rents have gone up 2.4 percent. So there's this dramatic difference between the way incomes are going up and the cost of housing is going up. Uh, I think we got ahead of ourselves. But anyway, this, this is a demonstration of some of the building permit. Yeah, go ahead and thank you. Uh, the building permit activity since 1990. As you can see, during the recession, we had a dramatic downturn in building permit activity. And quite frankly, in spite of the recent economic growth, uh, would have not seen a dramatic increase in the amount of housing that's being generated here in central Ohio. Why is that going? The methodology that we employed to take a look at the demand or the need for new housing in Central Ohio is to take a look at new employment generated, um, and this employment data, uh, employment data was compared to building permit activity. We took a look at three look back periods, 1990 to 2017, 2000 to 2017, and then the most uh, recent uh, uh, robust economic growth during 2010 to 2017. This is probably as likely as Bob Schottenstein winning the two airline tickets, but if you, go back, if you go back and look at the time period between 1991 and 2017, we added uh, 276,169 uh, permits were issued for, sing uh, for new housing units. We had 276,221 jobs, an incredible correlation that demonstrates that the uh, number of, of uh, jobs is directly correlated to, to building permits. 
<clears throat> this is probably the uh, meat of the analysis. Uh, we had made a projection based upon uh, the historic job growth trends within Central Ohio. The green line represents the most likely result of, of, uh, of uh, the number of housing units that will be needed in Central Ohio as a result, which is an indication of about 460,000 houses will be needed uh, by the year 2050 if we look at some, some of the conservative look back periods. Uh, the yellow uh, is, a, is a more uh, narrow look back period and, and the red numbers are really a, uh, just a reflection of the recent economic growth that Central Ohio has enjoyed. Uh, this table is, shows the uh, historic building permits that have been issued. Those are the blue lines on the left. Uh, the red line and the green line represents uh, our projections on what the uh, likely need is for housing units going forward. Uh, and it's based upon the historic job growth that we are expecting over the next 30 years. Um, we have a tremendous need. We have uh, a, a need for about 460,000 units over the next 30 years. Um, we had made a projection of housing need by income levels. The tables on the right reflect, or the, I should say the two colors, the blue represents the need for rental housing units. The gold represents the need for for sale housing units. Um, the two in, we have three income brackets, one over $90,000, one at $30,000, uh, uh, 90,000 and under 30,000. The columns on the left reflect really low income housing. That is, not, is going to be provided for through government subsidies. The uh, tables on the right indicate the demand for high end single or for high end housing. It's the, really the, uh, the ones in the middle, um, these two columns, where we're going to have the biggest problem. And I think you've heard the term the missing middle. Um, this is the area that we are going to have a hard time being able to address as we move into the future. As a last comparison, I think it's pretty dramatic to see the differences uh, between our peer cities. We identified three peer cities within our analysis. They include Austin at the top, Charlotte in the gray line, Nashville in the yellow line with uh, Central Ohio at the bottom. And this reflects the housing build, building permit activity that occurred during the past 17 years. And you can see the dramatic shortfall that we've had when we compare ourselves to, to the three peer cities uh, that, that, uh, that we've compared ourselves to. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the demand or the need for housing is going to be very significant. Our building permits, uh, which have averaged about seven or 8,000 a year over the past seven or eight years, is not even coming close to meeting the demand or the need. And this just illustrates that not only are we not generating enough housing, uh, locally, but we're also lagging behind the peer cities that we've compared ourselves to. Jim, with that, Jim, I think we're ready for you. Thanks, Rob. Let me uh, pile on a little bit more. If you look at the years since the uh, recovery, we've had an enormous demand for housing here. We've had historic low interest rates. We've had great job growth, as you mentioned, population growth. And we've had an unusual extreme number of a lack of homes for sale uh, on the existing market. These should be ideal conditions for home builders, perfect conditions, really. Yet instead of building nine or 10,000 homes a year, like we did during the boom, we're building three to 4,000. Why can't builders capitalize on what should be ideal conditions in this market? I'll answer that. Um, I think that's the, that is the question. And everyone in this room should know that uh, Builders are capitalizing on that in virtually every other market in the country, but not here. And the, you know, uh, the data that Rob shared, uh, and he could have pulled up so much more, but, you know, he, he didn't want to have everybody go home sick. Um, you know, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina is just a little bit bigger than Columbus. 
Uh, there's about 13,000 new homes sold a year in Charlotte. Austin, Texas today is about the same size as Columbus. There's 16,000 new homes being built in Austin this year. 16,000. Raleigh, North Carolina, a little smaller than Columbus. There's 10,000 new homes being built in Columbus. I mean, 10,000 in Raleigh. In Columbus this year, there'll be between three and 4,000. And I'm not sure exactly who's in the room. I think representatives of the city of Columbus are. Um, it's not because of them, it's because of all the other jurisdictions. Uh, this is a very exclusionary market. I'm from Columbus and I love this city and I'll never move out of this city, but uh, the limitations on density that builders are encumbered with here make it impossible to produce the level of housing needed to meet the demand that Jim, you've articulated. And frankly, if you, you know, uh, people that quote density with lack of quality, which is just, that's probably the builder's faults for not telling the story better. Density doesn't mean lack of quality. It just means, the lack of density just means more expensive. To put it another way, if we continue on the same track, it'll take three to four times more ground for us just to do what Rob thinks we need to do than it would otherwise take, which means you gotta go further and further and further and further out. And utilities become terribly stressed and roads, it's just, the, it, it, it is a problem here that um, I, there, there's, there's a lot I could say about this, but, um, uh, I'm sitting at lunch today with someone that lives in Grandview. Other than within the confines of the city of Columbus, you couldn't replicate another Grandview today anywhere in greater central Ohio. I think Grandview's a pretty nice neighborhood. Can't. The average density in Grandview is over four units per acre. The average density in greater central Ohio today is less than two. Less than two. So we've become the side yard capital of the United States. It's true. That's my answer. I'll chime in. I think one of the big fundamental issues we have is the DeRolf School funding ruling was more than 20 years ago, and they've never solved it down at the State House. So we have suburban school districts and suburban communities who do not want kids into their school districts. And it's the fault of a lot of our leaders at State Capitol that we have not been able to solve this issue. You go up north into the Olentangy School Districts, they are getting criminally low dollars per student in the Olentangy School District. And they really, they believe they have no choice but to, in a way, mandate higher value homes to pay for those kids. But think about that, that question. School districts don't want kids in them because they cannot afford them. And that has led to higher value, uh, a demand for higher um, cost of housing and less kids, less density. Bob, you're in some of these markets that Rob talked about, Austin, uh, Charlotte, Raleigh, you mentioned. What specifically um, do they allow that you would not, um, would, would not be able to do here in central Ohio? Is it, is it density? Yes. Is it permitting? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it's really all about density. Um, you know, the average lot size in, in new home development in Austin, Texas is 55 feet. How many 55 foot lots will be developed in greater central Ohio in 2019? Like two? And, you know, um, again, it's not about quality. You know, the average lot size in Grandview is probably 45, 50 feet. Average lot size in Bexley is less than 50 feet. What, let me ask about solution. I mean, what, what Rob uh, described as a, as a macro problem moving forward, but these issues are decided at, at the micro level, uh, at the township and municipal level. What incentive do municipalities have to relax their codes to address a macro level? I'll defer to Sandy on that one. <laughs> I don't know if you were talking to me or not. Yeah, I was so, um, you know, I, let me let me add one quick spin to this because I think it's really important. You're you're right. It, it is a micro level conversation we're having having, but I think it's really important for us to pull back for a second to understand why it matters. So, one of the things that's really interesting is you look at these cities that we're comparing ourselves here to, and 
and just an observation is that it, sometimes people find it surprising that we would compare ourselves to these cities. And yet I would argue that we absolutely should be because from an economic development standpoint, we're doing it all the time. We are competing with these communities every single day. We're winning, actually. Um, we've had tremendous success in the region over the last decade or more between the efforts of the different economic development organizations to be competing at that level. And yet we actually don't view ourselves that way. And so it becomes really tricky because if we're going to talk about being able to be a city like that, we've got to plan for it both from a housing and a transportation level that we're struggling to do. So now you take that down to the micro level and it's difficult to try to deal with the individual entities in every case. Once we step over a municipal boundary, the game changes and that's where the micro level comes into play. So I'm not sure there's a clear incentive except to be working on a cooperative scale, and we know we've tried that in some ways in the past, and that's been really challenging to do here. Is there a solution at all? <laughs> so we have, yeah. you've read recently a lot about the Columbus Way and you know regional collaboration through groups like Columbus 2020, and they have done a, a great job in uh, the Morpses of the world in bringing people together. Uh, the answer is that everybody seems to understand what the solution is, and that's what Bob alluded to earlier, higher densities, uh, uh, more efficient regulations. Uh, the challenge is, is that a lot of communities seem to say, we agree with the solution, but we're going to let our neighbors handle that. And until we solve that problem, I, it's, it's tough to see us getting around this issue. I do think that um, there are some specific things happening in certain municipalities. If you look at what has happened in Dublin with the Bridge Street Corridor, if you're familiar with it at all, there's an attempt to try to focus on multi-use. So there's housing, there's retail, there's commercial. But you also have to understand that in order for that to go forward, not only did they have to have a strong partnership with a private developer, the city invested a tremendous amount in that project and continues to do so. So uh, a project like that, it's, a, it's great on a micro level, but it takes a huge investment from multiple parties to make that happen. And that type of cooperation, while it does happen a lot in Columbus proper, isn't happening at a huge scale in the municipalities. But Dublin's a good example where they've tried to put their money where their mouth is and, and, and be an example of how to do that well. You know, um, I, I think that, that we're at fault um, for some of this, maybe most of it because I don't think we've done a good job telling our story, and I don't think we've done a good job of advocacy. Um, and it's hard, to, it's hard to, to make a point, you know, in a 20-minute, you know, luncheon or something. But I think that, um, I, I think there needs to be a greater and more concerted effort, some kind of a master planning uh, uh, process that brings together the various, you know, some of the key jurisdictions and suburbs within the county and to begin to have this dialogue. And um, I don't know that that will solve it, but I don't think it'll get worse. And, um, and that might be, you know, the way in which, you know, we begin to, to, to find an opening. The, the net effect of this is that Columbus has one of the highest rentership rates of any competing city in the country. Um, uh, those peer cities that, that Rob uh, put up on the board, uh, their home ownership rates are much higher than Columbus. So the, the, you might, if you listen to the, all the data, you might say, well, this doesn't make any sense. Where's everybody living? They got to be living somewhere. They are apartments. And um, there's nothing wrong with apartments. And there's nothing wrong with apartment development. But th this is about striking a balance. And, and, you know, I think that, um, I think we've gotten out of balance. Back in the 1980s and 90s, if someone had, been, if this panel had been convened, none of these points would have been valid because the, it, the, the situation that exists now did not exist then here in Greater Central Ohio. You mentioned apartments, which it seems like we see them popping up everywhere now. But it raises a question of where is the need uh, now and where it might it be? When you look at demographics, you see what is often referred to as the barbell effect, the, the need driven by baby boomers who are selling their family home uh, and looking for a different type of living, 
or millennials who are getting their first homes. Given that, are we providing the, the, the product that that audience needs, or is that the primary audience right now in um, the, the industry? Well, <clears throat> for some, clearly, um, the, the a downtown option, be it for rent or for sale, is is wonderful. Uh, I think it's spectacular what's happened between what's happening in Columbus between the university and German Village. I think that's just a it's just one of the greatest things that's ever happened to the city in my lifetime. By the way, that's happening in a lot of cities. We're not the only city in the country that, that you see that sort of reinvention, if you will. I think for a lot of the under 40 cohort, cohort apartments is the answer, but not for all of them. And um, the, the home ownership rate nationally, um, which is the percentage of people that own versus rent, amongst the under 40 cohort is a, a historic low um, by a lot. Um, now, a lot of that's getting married later, underemployed, student debt, a lot of things like that. But, but it's too low here. That's 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 the that's the bottom line. There's no one that takes care of it. You know, this this well, this thing is going to move in in baby steps. And a one percent increase in the home ownership rate in Columbus, Ohio, would take four thousand new home sales to forty five hundred. And a 2% increase in the homeownership rate would take us up to five to 6,000 and get us close to where a city like Indianapolis is today. What, Bob, you and I have talked about this before, but when I think of sort of the holy grail of, of your industry right now, it might be a $250,000 new home in a good school district that isn't 30 miles outside of the city. <clears throat> but yet I think the average new home in Delaware County last year was over 400,000, John. You can correct me if that's wrong, but um, why can't builders build that that $250,000 home uh, and still make a profit? Because two and two equals four, not three. I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, I don't mean to be sarcastic because when you know when you end up with a single-family lot. That, that's the biggest influencing factor on the end price of a home that, that costs between eighty dollars and $100,000 to produce, the, the math just doesn't work. You know, it, if you, if, even if you're able to build as low as 50 bucks a foot, you know, you start running those numbers out and, it, and, it, and then you add all the other things that come into play, it just, it just does not work. Are there alternatives? You've had a lot of success in Minerva Park, for example, Bob. But are there alternatives uh, to that traditional uh, suburban development that we've seen here for 30 or 40 years? Uh, you're, you're involved in some urban projects as well now. I mean, is there a future there that might address some of the uh, demand that Rob talked about? I feel like I'm monopolizing. Um, no, go ahead. Well, I mean, I think it's a lot of things. Um, uh, yeah, yeah that, uh, it's not any one thing, but there is a main thing here. I mean, I, I think if, if, if we leave this luncheon with, any, with one uh, point, it's that regulation, which is code for zoning, which is code for density, which does not mean lack of quality, is the biggest impediment to meeting the housing needs that Rob's study establishes conclusively we're going to need. And unless we find a way to flip the script, it's going to be really, really tough for Columbus 2020, and I'm on that board, to continue to attract companies to come here because their employees don't want to live in apartments. I, I would also add, if you look at the slide that talked about the middle, I think that is really, really important for us to be paying particular attention to. So we, we, we use the term affordable housing a lot, we use the term the middle. And if you look at that middle group, part of the problem, I'm not a developer, but we certainly spend a lot of time in this space, whether it's single family, multifamily, senior housing, one of the really tricky problems with developing in areas that are more downtown, more urban, is the availability of the land. And when you get into a situation where you're trying to do a product that's going to be a smaller product, a lower price point product, I find it very difficult to see how we do that without good public-private partnerships because this, the city has a really important role in helping to 
uh, engage where the land is. If you, if you can envision a situation where there's a neighborhood that may be ripe for that kind of redevelopment, but you have some homeowners in a single block that are taking care of their homes and some that are not and some that are abandoned, it's impossible for a developer to go in and redo that without being able to, to acquire all of that land. And so it gets really tricky when uh, we look to try to do things in a, an urban setting where it would be good to do that. Transportation's a little easier, access to jobs might be easier for somebody, cuts down on all the driving time. But I really believe we've got to continue to work really closely together in both, the, both sectors to try to find ways to bring those land parcels together to develop them in a way that we can do it in an affordable way. There's, there's really five drivers to cost, the five L's if you will. There's the cost of labor, which has gone up because we have a pervasive uh, shortage of workforce in the skilled trades, not only in central Ohio, not only in Ohio, but nationally. The cost of lots and land, as Bob alluded to, have gone up. The cost of lending has gone up. The local regulatory scheme has gone up. And really, the cost of lumber and material prices have gone up significantly recently. So. When you add all those together, that $250,000 house becomes a real tough number to meet. So you add on top of that, you go to a municipality that states in their residential design code that you must have a front porch that meets this specification. You must have a garage that sets four feet back from the front of the house. You must have X, you must have Y, you must have Z. And by the way, your house can't look anything like your neighbor's. And it is impossible to do that. And they are effectively putting a moratorium on housing through residential design standards and zoning. And what is going to happen, as Bob alluded to, is companies are going to come to Columbus. And one of the, the big attractive points of Columbus, what do we like to say, cost of living and our commute times. Well, when we can't build that housing, we have to continue going further and further outside of the 270 beltway, which is great if it happens naturally. It's not great if we're forced to because we have to. We're gonna be a less attractive place to, for businesses to come and for our existing businesses to grow. I agree. <laughs> No. Uh, John, is there anything the BIA is doing now to try to remedy this? You're trying to get the word out here and elsewhere, of course, but any other particular legislative or um, other initiatives that the BIA is pursuing? Yeah, I think at the State House, um, uh, OHBA, the Ohio Home Builders Association, is leading a charge on uh, uh, tax policy reform currently. Um, developers are taxed on property um, as, if a, as if building has begun, and it is not. Uh, we're trying to get that changed so that you, property couldn't be reassessed until after the property has actually been built and sold, which seems proper. And the second thing is really working with local municipalities, again, on these, some of these standards. We, um, it, it appears that a lot of our local elected officials have a lot of time to watch HGTV. <laughs> and they have fancied themselves Chip and Joanna and are implementing standards. And what they should be doing is putting in minimum standards for the safety of the community. And we're all for keeping the character of the community, but communities evolve. And it is not the job of elected officials and something we need to do a better job of making the argument of to put their own personal tastes upon builders and future residents of their community. They are restricting consumer choice. If Bob builds a, a home that is the, uh, the envy of the world and everybody wants to have this particular model home, they should be allowed to build it. But in most jurisdictions, they say, well, eh, that model's across the street. You gotta pick something else. That's not fair and that's not helping our industry. Sandy, you've uh, worked, I know, in all types of housing, uh, including senior housing and, and rental and even affordable. When you look uh, at our market uh, now and in the future, is, is there any particular type of housing that you see a big demand for that uh, maybe isn't being built or uh, isn't being built enough beyond what we've talked? I, I'm thinking actually of senior housing in particular. There's been an explosion in that the last couple of years, but if you look at the numbers, the demand for that is just going to continue to skyrocket. 
Yeah, there's, excuse me, there's been a huge focus the last several years on senior housing. There are a number of communities we've worked on around the region that address that, that type of housing. Um, obviously, that will continue the, to follow the population need as the market demands it to be. Uh, so the, I don't think at this point we'll have quite the shortage that maybe we might have several years ago. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are today regarding the need specifically for senior housing, but we still continue to have quite a bit of work in that area. Uh, as far as the rest of the housing, it's, it's what, I, what we've already said. It's that, it's that middle. It's difficult. Um, we know there's a lot of apartment buildings still going on. There's condos. There's loft opportunities, things like that. But uh, as we are involved in that, we rarely see that anymore as a singular thing. It's typically involved in some other type of redevelopment, whether it's a mixed use with retail, that kind of thing. So the model of how that's getting done, not, not that there's not still standalone apartment complexes, of course there are, but it, we're seeing a lot more of the mixed use development combining that than in the past. It, it seems that you mentioned Dublin, of course. It seems as though some municipalities are a little more uh, willing to listen to some of these mixed use if it's presenting in a planned development. You look at Evans Farm, for example, is another one with smaller lot size. Is that one, solution to what we're talking about, these planned communities. I don't know that it's the answer for all, and Evans Farm, as Jim mentioned, site of our 2019 Parade of Homes, July 13th through 28th, so feel free to come check that out. Um, I, I think that is, that is a tool in the toolbox. I don't think it can be the end all, because it, it's just not doable for every community that comes up. I also think um, uh, the so-called town center concept, um, live work, um, neo-traditional, um, where it does work, it's charming, but most of the places where it's been tried between California and Maine and every, every state north and south, it, it has not succeeded. and. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to manufacture that kind of a, of a neighborhood, you know, uh, from a planning standpoint. Um, so um, I think from a, in terms of whether we'll see a lot of that happen, uh, it's, it's a very high risk, in, at least in my judgment, um, based on what we've seen. It's a very, very high risk uh, initiative for a private, uh, you know, a private company to take. Um, with that, uh, I think we can open it up to uh, questions uh, for the panel. Um, yeah. Um, and there's a microphone, I'm sorry, there's a microphone over here. Is that the only one, Andy? Yeah, sorry. I'm Kathy Fox with the Pizzuti Companies, and um, I wonder if each of the panelists might speak to their familiarity with the Insight 2050 program that um, was initiated by Urban Land Institute, Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and um, I believe the Columbus Partnership, and whether the lessons from that effort um, are being applied well or need further um, dissemination out and around central Ohio in order to be helpful? I'll go first. It needs to be better disseminated to me. <laughs> I'm not that familiar with, with the report, Kathy. I, I think I've heard of it, but um, I apologize. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it, and I see Yarmir in the room, but we won't point him out at the back there. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, I think it, it contains a lot of really useful information. There was a pretty concerted effort for a period of time to get around and share it and in a lot of open forums, and I think a lot of work was done around that. Um, and I, I don't, I don't, I can't say necessarily that I would say it's implemented. I think the ideas that are out there have been put out there in a way that is unique to our area. So obviously the study was done unique to Central Ohio and it contains a lot of valuable information. But understand that a lot of what it, it contained is information about what if scenarios. 
So what if we continue to develop the same way? What if we develop slightly differently? What if we do a different combination? So there's a lot of things in there where, again, it kind of comes back to municipalities considering working together in a different scale in order to implement on a broad basis. It's an excellent study, and if you haven't looked at it, it's well worth pulling it up online and taking a look. Sandy said it way better than I could, so <laughs> that too. <laughs> I should have let you go first. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay Smith. Um, I've been a commercial real estate broker for 48 years. I don't know how that happened. Um, and I started the development in industry by uh, uh, selling lots to Irving Schottenstein in a trailer on the frontage of uh, what of the Little Turtle project. So I've been around for a while, but I think there's another elephant in the room that people don't talk about, and that is uh, having seen a lot of Rob's market research and being involved in a lot of apartments, especially downtown. There's um, clearly a, a very very strong movement uh, amongst the upcoming markets to smaller homes. Uh, and less children. And we see that in the redevelopment of areas like uh, the intersection of uh, Livingston and Parsons, for example. And what I wonder is what's going to happen to all of these 4,500 square foot houses in southern Delaware County and New Albany and Dublin uh, 15 years from now when absolutely nobody wants them? Um, I think we're going to be looking at an entirely new aspect of redevelopment. Uh, and to me, the only solution to our problem is regional uh, zoning. I saw recently where the city of Minneapolis just eliminated single family zoning. They eliminated it. But they can do that because Minneapolis zones their whole region. Um, any comments would be appreciated. I think the plan calls for, I believe, basically, if you own a lot, you can put three up to three homes on that lot, um, no questions asked. It's a, it's a really interesting concept. And representing the building industry, you know, it, it's, it's not the BIA's job to say what type of housing we should be building. I think the key is that we build what the market demands, and if that's what the market demands, then Hopefully, we will be able to meet that demand. To the earlier point, though, if we are, have such restrict, restrictive regulations on density and zoning, we may not be able to meet that demand in many of the markets, and that's, a, that's something we hope to avoid. Um, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, uh, you might be right, Jay. Um, by the way, Jay's father was Harrison Smith of the famous Smithy Award. Um, uh, one, Jay called out my dad, Irving, his, his father, Harrison Smith, who was one of the greatest zoning lawyers in the history of this country. And uh, anyway, uh, it's good to see you, Jay. Um, I, I, don't, I, think, I think we do need smaller houses. I don't know how small, but people have been saying that for a long, long time. It hasn't quite happened. And um, um, I don't know what's going to happen to all those homes, but I have a feeling people will be living in them, but you know, we'll, we'll see. But I, I just think we're out of balance here. And um, we do business in Minneapolis, and it's a great city, uh, like Columbus, um, but there's uh, infinitely more opportunities to develop smaller lots and smaller houses throughout the Twin Cities in all pieces and parts. And there's some beautiful neighborhoods up there. There's probably people up here that are very familiar with the area. That would be another example of what, what someone's doing that we're not. Is there another question? Yeah. Thank you all. My name is Chris Herman. I'm with MKSK. And I have an observation I'd love to get your, your uh, thoughts, reaction to. Um, as a, a planner practicing in the region for probably three decades now, I think the education point is really important. And what I see is with communities like Dublin that take the step to go towards Bridge Park development, other communities that talk about approving higher density housing, the council and the elected bodies get under pressure. The people that approve those kinds of things end up getting run against or issues get put on the ballot that basically take those capabilities away or actually replace those elected officials. And so when I, as I watch this, I think that is a chilling effect 
on communities to try to do the things we're talking about and the things like the ULI, ULI 2050 study. So I, I think education is really important. I'd love to hear your reaction to that. Yeah, I think one of the people to blame for this is Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and you go to different communities and the minute there's a zoning, a Facebook group emerges and you know an elected official says, oh my gosh, there's 100 people who don't like this not thinking that they represent 10,000. And um, the loudest voices in the room often get heard. Um, and I, I think it will take a job from our industry to really do a good job of educating them and, and then standing by them when their decisions are made that are unpopular. Chris, I think I, that's actually a really great uh, question. And actually, while we right before we got started, I was thinking about something to your point, and that is that if you look at what, the, what happened with the Insight 2050 study, there was a really concerted effort to roll that out and educate people, um, everybody from zoning groups to public officials to church groups. I mean, it was a very um, detailed process to try to get that information out. I, I would offer that the same should happen here because I think that you know what's contained in this necessarily isn't the solution to everything but the numbers are pretty stunning and I would venture to say for some of you in the room right now who maybe don't spend a lot of time on this they're pretty shocking and for those of us who do spend a lot of time on it it confirms what we know so I I'm not sure that we uh, solve anything necessarily overnight with it, but I do think that all of these things, whether it's the ULI study, permit studies, this kind of study, we need to continue to talk about a way to get that information out. And what I was going to say to you afterwards was we should look at convening a forum for the municipalities. Because it's not a Columbus problem, it's a central Ohio problem. And I, and I do think there's a lot of good people in a lot of municipalities who would appreciate the education, but I think we would be better off doing it as a group as opposed to individual municipalities. It would be an interesting dialogue if we could convene that. Yes. Hi there, my name is Jalen Grisso. Um, I'm part of an organization called Matter News. Uh, it's an investigative news startup here in Columbus. Uh, and the biggest issue that we're investigating is development and how it's done here. Um, and so I know that you all mentioned earlier that um, from the development side of it, that the story that is put forth oftentimes by developers isn't always the best story. And so I was wondering how you would present your story as developers and what part of that you would reframe and restructure that uh, might not be known by most people or that but um, might not be the way that you often are presented. Want me to go with that? Bro broadly, I, I'll say um, when a home building project goes up, you're building a community. You're, let, you're being inclusive. You're letting people come into this community that they think is great enough that they're going to move into it. And that's something that we should remember, that Think of the homes that you grew up in. That's what our folks are doing on a daily basis. They're building homes where people are going to live, where they're going to have memories, and they want to add to the community. I don't see how not letting people come into a community is somehow additive. This protect what you have thing, it, it doesn't seem to be um, very neighborly, if you will. And we need to do a better job of talking about the additive nature of home building and development. You know, um, the, the, the comment I made that I don't think we do a very good job telling the story was not so much the story of what we do, but the story that I don't think is well told is the story of the continuation of these policies in greater central Ohio that if left on, that if we stay on this course, I don't think we're going to, we're going to wake up one day and I not particularly care for, for what we see. But I think that the, that the story about development that maybe needs to be told a little better too, at least the business that we're in, is um, uh, we get no tax abatement. Uh, we get virtually no public support by virtue of, in other words, every community we develop, we pay for the infrastructure. Those streets that, that people can drive on that become public, we paid for. Those water lines that provide public water, we pay for. The sewer lines that go in and connect to other lines under the ground, we pay for them. And we help build infrastructure that ultimately, hopefully, creates nice neighborhoods where people want to live. And I mean, you know, easy for me to say, but it, I think it's the underbelly of the American economy, and it's also been the underbelly of the, of the middle class. And um, I think that the, that, uh, 
that that's what builds strong cities. Um, I know there's times when tax incentives and tax abatement are needed to promote areas that have been left, you know, to die, like between the university and German Village, and we've seen, you know, of course, once you start that tax abatement stuff, it's hard to wean the developers off of it. But um, that's another story. But not us. I mean, we just never, you know, we chose, we choose to be pretty much suburban for the most part uh, throughout our company uh, developer. And um, there, there is no, I guess the only public-private partnership is we need to get public approval to spend our money. <laughs> I, I want to add one quick thing. I, I think it's great that you're asking that question, actually. And, and um, I, we're not developers. We do work with developers a lot. But I think there's something we should keep in mind here, and that is we're, we have a remarkable community here. And, and I don't want to have that be overlooked because we wouldn't actually be sitting here having this conversation if there wasn't a reason why people wanted to be here. And so I think it's really, really important that we keep the spirit of intent and growth in a way that we understand that we're trying to build community. Yes, and it, it, I think it's really critical. And for, for those of you that m maybe don't spend a lot of time in other cities, I will tell you, and I think you've, you've heard the same thing, I repeatedly hear over and over from people who come to the region from other parts of the country how incredibly amazed they are at what an amazing place this is. And it's about people. It's not, we don't have the mountains and the beach and all that good stuff. What we have is a community of people who actually do really work hard together. So we have a really huge issue in front of us. I'm glad we can look in the mirror and talk about it, but I believe in the spirit of this community to solve it, and I think we have to keep that in mind. They are partners in that process. They're, they're not the enemy. They actually build the communities we live in, and, and I, I like to think that's who we are. I think what Sandy just said is, is, is so, so true. And, it, and it's making me think I've been too negative. Um, <laughs> maybe I have been. There, Columbus has an extraordinary heart and soul, and that's what people fall in love with when they, when they, people want to come here and once they, people maybe don't necessarily want to come here, but once they get here, they don't want to leave. And I think that's, that's been the way this city has been for a long, long time. And I think that, that, that in, in, the, in the recent past, the, the issue that's on the table today is, you know, increasingly we're going to start playing left-handed as we fight for companies to relocate here and to continue to grow, because you got like two choices: you either grow, or you don't. And if you don't, that's not a good outcome either. So you, once you're on the treadmill, you got to keep running. And um, and we do, you know, I suppose we compete with Dayton and Cleveland and Cincinnati to some extent, but we're competing fiercely with the Raleigh's and the Charlottes and the Austins and the Dallas's and the Seattle's, and, and we're winning a lot of those competitions. We want to keep winning, yeah. and that's what this is about. Yeah. We have time for one more. Yep. Last one. Hi, I am Stephanie Rosinski. I am a realtor, uh, Steph the Realtor at uh, Cutler Real Estate. I'm also a Columbus Tourism Ambassador, and my question is about storytelling, kind of uh, going off exactly what you were just talking about. About half of my clients are from out of state. They're relocating here, um, and if those of you in the room who don't know, it's often through a relocation company that's almost always out of town, um, and they're directing folks to come to us, and we are supposed to be the local guides to the city. Um, I see a lot of what Experience Columbus does in terms of rolling out the red carpet and getting people interested in the tourism aspect, and I have knocked on that door several times in terms of asking them for help and how do we present our city to the people who are staying? Because I'll get the, the report from the relocation company and it'll almost always say, you know, we have an executive coming for XYZ company, Dublin, New Albany, Southern Delaware, done. They don't want to see the, the neighborhoods that are, have more um, homes per acre and things like that. They want to see the sprawling homes that they were told by their relocation company. I think we have an image problem. How do we better tell the story about how diverse our housing situation is and how do we get more people interested in living in some of the places that are not New Albany, Dublin, Southern Delaware? Have you had that conversation with Experience Columbus? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, that's a really good question. I'm not, I'm not sure if any of us is the expert on that in particular, but uh, gosh, I think there's a ton of resources out there and a lot of really great communities, and maybe we need to find a better way to connect the ambassadors for those particular 
municipalities, regions of this, the city to be engaged in those conversations because I, 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 don't, I, I understand what you're saying. I also think there's a lot of people moving to the region that aren't looking for that kind of housing and frankly can't afford that kind of housing. And so there have been a lot of efforts to try to connect those folks, but maybe we do need to do a better job uh, of doing that. And I'm not sure exactly where that would be done, but Experience Columbus, I think, is a great partner for that concept. I don't know if you have better thought. I'm, I'm not really sure. That's a good question. That's not a fun way to uh, end this. <laughs> Well, thank you, speakers. We so appreciate you taking the time to discuss this challenging issue. Let's thank our sponsors, Smith & Hale, Dispatch Media Group, Taft, Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing, and our speakers, John Melkai, Bob Schottenstein, Sandy Doyle Ahern, Jim Weicker, and Bob Vogt. And thanks to all of you for being here, and we'll see you next week.